Hello, good morning, and welcome to today's presentation on twin pregnancy or multiple gestation. Multiple gestation or pregnancy is a simultaneous development of two or more fetuses in the uterus. I said two or more fetuses because we may have instances whereby the fetus may be three, four, five, six, and so on. However, twin uh, gestation, which is two fetuses, is the most common type of multiple pregnancy. Now, the rate of multiple pregnancy increases uh, in case the mother's age is also uh, increased. That's more than 35 years. And sometimes also when we have assisted uh, reproductive technology such as in vitro uh, fertilization and also genetic factors play a role. Now, with the etiological factors, we uh, see it mostly uh, in uh, high among uh, African Americans. And so race plays uh, a role over here. And it's also believed that in some tribes in Nigeria, there is a high incidence of multiple pregnancies amongst them. We also have hereditary playing a role uh, and basically uh, it's through the maternal line uh, other than the you know paternal line and as i said earlier on advancing age of the mother also plays a critical role uh, between the ages of 30 and 35 years then we have uh, iatrogenic like i said earlier on whereby we have uh, assisted reproductive technology such as the in vitro fertilization and also uh, in women who uh, have been treating uh, infertility for some time whereby we try to induce uh, ovulation by the use of some drugs such as clomiphene and also continuous uh, taking uh, of follicle stimulating hormone all these uh, will enhance the chances uh, or the possibilities of getting a multiple uh, pregnancy now we can classify multiple pregnancy based on the number of fetuses. And in this case, we have twin, triplets, quadruplets, and so on. We may also classify it based on the number of fertilized eggs. And in this case, we talk about the zygosity uh, of the pregnancy. And also, we may uh, talk about, uh, uh, we may classify it based on the number of placentas. And in this case, we may talk about the chorionicity. We may have one placenta or two placentas. Then also we can classify it based on the number of amniotic sacs. Uh, in this case, we talk about the amnionicity. So we may have one amnion or two uh, amnions uh, together. Now, coming back to the number of fertilized eggs, we may have a dizygotic twin in which uh, two eggs are fertilized and also a monozygotic uh, twin in which only one egg is fertilized. Now, in monozygotic twins, after the fertilization of a single egg, we may have subdivisions. And over here, we may have uh, a diamniotic and a dichorionic twin. And this usually takes place when uh, the fertilization occurs within 72 hours. and on ultrasound, we may find a sign called the lambda sign or the twin peak, which I will show you very soon. Then we may also have another uh, case where we have monochorionic and diamniotic. That means we have two uh, uh, chorions or two placentas and two uh, amnions. And this usually takes place uh, or this usually occur when the division uh, took place between the fourth and the eighth day of fertilization of the inner cell mass and also on ultrasound you may find a sign called a t sign which i'll show you soon we may also find out uh, that uh, there is monoamniotic and monochorionic that is we have one uh, amniotic sac and one chorion or placenta for these uh, fetuses and it's usually uh, when the division took place between the eighth day uh, of fertilization when the amniotic cavity or the amniotic sac uh, was already formed then in uh, you know, uh, extreme cases or in rare instances we may have what we call the conjoined or the siamese uh, twins and this usually uh, occurs uh, when the when the division occurred two weeks or from the 13th day 
uh, of fertilization and it's a very rare incidence now this is exactly what i'm talking about when one egg is released from the ovary and fertilized by one sperm three main occurrences may take place so on the left the middle and the right now on the left one we are still in the morula stage and so the early embryo will split before implanting into the uterus and this will uh, usually take place between uh, the day one and day three of fertilization and when this happens we are going to get a dichorionic and a diamniotic uh, you know uh, twin and so in this case both of them are having separate placentas and also separate amniotic sacs in the middle we realize that the early embryo implants in the uterus and then splits this is the stage of the blastocyst and this takes place between day four and day eight of fertilization and over here uh, the two uh, fetuses are going to share one placenta so monochorionic but they are going to have separate uh, amniotic sacs so as you can see they have separate amniotic sacs but they have one placenta and in the third uh, stage we may have the early embryo implanting in the uterus and then splitting later on and this stage is the implanted blastocyst stage and it occurs between the eighth and the 13th day uh, of fertilization and so uh, the two fetuses may be sharing one uh, placenta so monochorionic and they may also be sharing one amniotic sac so monoamniotic and as i said in extreme cases uh, we find conjoined or siamese twins and this usually takes place when the uh, uh, embryonic disc has already been formed and usually is between the 13th and 15th uh, day uh, of fertilization so over here as you can see we have uh, mono uh, amniotic and monochorionic whereby they are sharing one placenta and the same amniotic uh, sac uh, that's the one on the far left uh, corner then uh, below it we have the di uh, amniotic and the mono uh, chorionic whereby both of them are sharing uh, two uh, separate uh, amniotic sac but they have one uh, 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 placenta now on the far right we have far right corner we have the diamniotic uh, uh, dichorionic and in this case uh, they are fused together so each of them uh, has its own placenta and amniotic sac but they are fused together in the middle then we have diamniotic and also dichorionic which is separated each of them has its own placenta and amniotic uh, sac now determination of chorionicity is very important because each of uh, these twins presents with different complications and so it's very very important that we are able to differentiate or determine uh, the type of chorionicity as the pregnancy you know advances because it will also help us uh, you know in managing these women and so uh, we can determine the chorionicity uh, uh, preferably and also reliably uh, with an ultrasound usually uh, within uh, uh, the later part of the first trimester now if uh, it is dichorionic twin there will be a v-shaped extension of the placenta tissue into the base of the intertwin membrane so in the first diagram on the left which is labeled dichorea you see that uh, there is a circled and encircled place whereby the placenta tissue is protruding or extending down and it meets that line which is called the intertwin membrane and it forms a v-shape 
If you look at the structure below it, you can see it very clearly, uh, whereby the uh, uh, placenta extends inwards to the base of the intertwin uh, membrane and it forms a V shape. This is what we call the lambda sign or the twin peak. And when you see this on ultrasound, it gives an indication that it is a dichorionic uh, multiple pregnancy. On the right, we have the monochorionic pregnancy. And as you can see the circumscribed area, we have the intertwin membrane entering into the uh, placenta uh, over there. This time there is no extension. And so it forms what we call the T sign. And looking at the structure or the diagram below, the second ultrasound below, you can see it very nicely uh, where the uh, intertwin membrane enters into the uh, placenta and forms uh, a T sign. When you see this on an ultrasound, it gives you an indication that this is a monochorionic uh, multiple pregnancy. Now, it is important to note that determining the chorionicity in later part of pregnancy uh, is less reliable. And so in such uh, cases, uh, we have to rely on the number of placentas as well as the sex of the fetuses and also uh, some characteristics of the intertwin membrane in determining the chorionicity. And so uh, when we look at the uh, characteristics of the intertwin membrane, we, we may find out that the intertwin membrane is thicker in dichorionic as compared to it being thin in the uh, monochorionic uh, multiple pregnancy. Now, let's uh, look at the determination of the zygosity of the pregnancy. Now, basically, the zygosity, as we've seen, we'll talk about uh, monozygotic and dizygotic. Monozygotic meaning that uh, uh, only one egg was you know, fertilized and they are usually identical twins. They share or uh, they have uh, one uh, placenta, which is monochorionic, or sometimes they have two separate uh, placentas, which is dichorionic. Usually, or in almost all the time, we have communicating vessels present uh, in between them. And also, uh, the intervening membranes are two uh, amniotic uh, sacs. Then their sex is always identical. They always have the same sex. Then their genetic makeup are always the same. And they also accept uh, skin grafting. On the other hand, the dizygotic twins uh, are also known as the non-identical twins or the fraternal twins. They result from the fertilization of two separate eggs. Now, uh, they have two placentas which are often fused together and there is always absent communicating uh, vessels between them and they may have, you know, uh, four uh, intervening membranes whereby we have uh, two amnions and two chorions. Sometimes you may have one amnion in between and two uh, chorions on either side. Their sex may uh, differ. And also their uh, genetic uh, features or their DNA may also differ. They may reject skin uh, grafting as well. And it is important for us to note that not all uh, chorionic uh, pregnancies are dizygotic. However, all monochorionic pregnancies are monozygotic. Now, how do we diagnose multiple pregnancy? We may do this based on the history. For instance, if there is a genetic predisposition of the woman, uh, you know, in getting uh, multiple pregnancy, or even if there is a familiar history of multiple uh, pregnancy, we can use it as a diagnosis or help us in our diagnosis and also we may find out from the woman if she's been on some infertility uh, drugs uh, or drugs which we use to induce ovulation such as the clomiphene and also has been on multiple use of follicle stimulating hormone and also uh, we can find out if uh, uh, she's ever had any assisted reproductive technology such as in vitro uh, fertilization being done now in the first trimester 
we can diagnose multiple pregnancy when the woman experiences increasing mo uh, morning sickness and so there is severe nausea and vomiting and also when the size of the uterus is larger compared to the gestational age we may also uh, be thinking of multiple pregnancy and also when the woman excessively gains weight and also has increased uh, appetite now in the second to third trimester uh, this woman may have tendencies of uh, having pida edema and also the abdomen may become extremely large and also may be experiencing some cardiorespiratory uh, uh, embarrassment we can also use the external obstetric uh, examinations to you know determine whether it's a multiple uh, uh, pregnancy or not for instance if we palpate uh, multiple parts on abdominal palpation we may conclude or we may come to the realization that it's a multiple uh, pregnancy and also if the fundal height is larger as well as the uh, abdominal circumference is larger than the period of uh, gestation we may uh, also be thinking of multiple pregnancy and if we find uh, you know uh, two fetal heads at different parts uh, on abdominal palpation and also if you're able to auscultate you know, uh, 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 fetal heart sound at two different areas, then we can also uh, be suspecting multiple pregnancies. Now, with the use of cardio uh, monitors, we can, you know, identify uh, the, you know, uh, fetal heart sound or the, uh, the, the uh, heart function of the fetus simultaneously and we'll be able to determine whether it is only one or, you know, uh, multiple uh, twin we can also uh, diagnose multiple pregnancies using the ultrasound as we've seen uh, earlier on then with uh, the biochemical test we may see that alpha fetoprotein may be on the rise uh, this uh, is a protein produced by the uh, fetal liver and it's present in maternal circulation and so anytime uh, there is uh, you know multiple uh, pregnancies its level increases this is because two or three or more uh, fetuses are producing uh, these uh, proteins, and so the level will be high, as well as uh, an increase in the levels of human chorionic gonadotropin uh, hormone. Now, it is important for us to also differentiate all these uh, with uh, cases such as polyhydraminose, big baby, also, uh, you know, huge fibroid in the uterus, and also some ovarian tumors. Now, all these may also uh, cause increase in maternal weight as well. And so we uh, have to differentiate between this uh, and multiple uh, pregnancy. Now, with the complication of multiple pregnancy, I have a separate video on complications uh, of multiple uh, pregnancies. So over here, I will talk about some little uh, specifics. We have maternal complications as well as fetal complications and basically uh, the mothers will experience what we call hyperemesis gravidarium and uh, in this case the women usually experience excessive nausea and vomiting and uh, this will lead to uh, weight loss as well as dehydration in these uh, uh, women and this uh, can even cause some electrolyte imbalances in them they may also have iron deficiency uh, anemia it is because there is depletion of the iron stores to help uh, you know supply these growing fetuses now uh, we can also talk about uh, operative interferences uh, this is uh, because uh, the woman uh, or the woman may not have you know uh, uh, requested for operation however once it is multiple pregnancies some complications may set in and the woman may have to go in for operations and so it becomes a complication and a worry uh, to this woman and also they may experience postpartum uh, hemorrhages usually uh, due to uh, uh, you know uterine atony then the fetus uh, may also uh, be having a preterm uh, birth and this will be complicated uh, with cerebral palsy uh, and also uh, they may uh, be having some uh, mental retardation but specific complications of monoamniotic pregnancy will include the cord uh, accident uh, usually uh, you know the cords entangle 
uh, themselves and this situation is very you know always uh, acute and very fatal and so most obstetricians uh, recommend cesarean section by 32 to 34 weeks uh, of uh, pregnancy to prevent uh, these uh, called entanglement also a specific complication to the monochorionic uh, pregnancy is the twin to twin transfusion syndrome as i've said i have a separate video on this so you can watch uh, this one to get more information about this but basically what happens in the twin to twin uh, transfusion syndrome uh, is that we have as you can see in this diagram the left diagram low uh, diagram uh, we have the donor and the recipient and they have uh, a, a communicating vessel now one of the fetus which is the donor is always supplying blood to the recipient and so you could see that uh, this fetus uh, has become so little and this is because the amniotic fluid a major component of the amniotic fluid is the uh, uh, urine of the fetus and so since it is receiving less uh, blood it becomes uh, oligoric and also uh, you know there is growth uh, restriction however the second uh, fetus which is the recipient uh, fetus receives a lot of the blood and also and so it becomes uh, hypervolemic and also it gets uh, uh, polyuria and polyhydraminos and so uh, because it is urinating a lot and so the amount of amniotic fluid is increasing in uh, his case so as you can see it's growing bigger and has a large amniotic fluid whilst the donor uh, fetus is you know kind of shrunk uh, over there now uh, most of most obstetricians recommend management or treatment of this through uh, amino uh, synthesis whereby we uh, draw uh, some uh, amount of amniotic fluid from the uh, recipient donor. This is because this is important because it will lead to risks such as myocardial uh, damage as well as uh, you know uh, cardiac uh, failure in the recipient uh, fetus because it is receiving more blood than it uh, requires. We can also uh, do uh, uh, you know uh, coagulation uh, of the. Uh, connecting blood vessels to prevent this communication and as you can see uh, on the upper left corner we have the entanglement of the vessels and also on the right then we also have uh, another complication being the locking uh, of the twins as you can see this one uh, the uh, presenting part is the bridge or the first twin is being delivered by bridge and the second twin is coming with uh, uh, cephalic and so their heads are locking each other now how do we manage this form of pregnancy it is important for us to start management at the antenatal uh, level and so we encourage the women to have uh, you know adequate uh, nutrition and also rest we may supplement uh, their nutrition with some uh, uh, therapy such as iron because we may want to prevent iron deficiency anemia we also give some calcium to help in strengthening the bones of both the mother as well as the fetus and also some folic acid may be uh, given now we always have to encourage the mothers to come uh, you know uh, or to attend regular antenatal clinics and we may uh, also do uh, ultrasound for them every three to four weeks in order to identify any complications with these uh, pregnancies now by the 10 to 14 week we may determine the chorionicity so that we can help the mothers or we can identify any problems which arises by 28th week of gestation we may want uh, to give uh, uh, all deliveries all babies who are delivered before uh, this period or we did uh, at this period some uh, steroids to help in the maturation of their lung and so uh, it is advisable that uh, all deliveries below uh, 38 weeks you have to give uh, them uh, some stories to help in the maturation of their lungs especially if you are dealing with a mono uh, amniotic and a monochorionic twin now it is advisable to induce labor whenever there are signs of fetal growth restrictions however 
by 34th to 37th week of gestation, you may have to induce labor in the monochorionic twin. And also by the 38th week of gestation, you may have to induce labor in the dichorionic and the diamniotic twin. In all these cases, you have to assess the uh, fetal lung maturity and give uh, steroids uh, in accordance to it. Now, during labor, uh, you may have to determine whether you give, you, you conduct uh, vaginal delivery or caesarean section. Now, you can conduct vaginal delivery only in case both of the twins, or at least the first twin, is presenting with uh, the, in, in the cephalic uh, presentation. If not, you may have to resort to caesarean section, which, are, which we shall see very soon. Then you may want to prevent any form of uh, general anesthesia because we need the woman to, you know, aid or we need the effort of the woman in uh, uh, the delivery. And so you didn't want to cause any form of anesthesia uh, in this uh, uh, patient. Now, the giving of egometrin or, uh, or oxytocin when the anterior shoulder of the first baby is uh, delivered should be avoided make sure you do not give oxytocin or egometrin when the anterior shoulder of the first twin is born and right after delivery of the first twin you have to make sure you immediately cl uh, clamp the cord and cut in between it to prevent what we call the exsanguination of the second baby and basically this is when the blood from the second twin is drained out from it and it can usually you know kill this baby it's, it is the fastest way of killing the second twin when uh, you do not you know uh, uh, prevent uh, the drainage of the blood from this uh, fetus and uh, as a rule, we can also leave about 8 to 10 centimeters of the cord uh, behind in order uh, to give some drugs or even transfuse uh, this baby. Now, uh, as we've seen, we can also give 0.2 milligram of uh, methyl uh, agometrin or oxytocin to decrease the risk of postpartum hemorrhage after uh, the birth of the second baby. Note here, it is after delivery of the second baby preferably uh, once the anterior shoulder of the second baby is born you can give uh, these uh, methagen or methyl um, egometrin or oxytocin uh, you know to uh, reduce the risk of postpartum uh, hemorrhage and you must make sure that you actively manage the third stage of labor to prevent further complications we can further give oxytocin infusion for at least uh, one hour Post, uh, delivery now under what circumstances do we require caesarean section when there is placenta previa that's when the placenta is not uh, located at the right place uh, preferably at the fundus of the uterus or it's located anywhere getting close to the os you may want to conduct caesarean section because it can detach and so you didn't want to you know, uh, implicate the fetuses in this. Also, when there is severe preeclampsia, yeah, you may want to conduct a caesarean section yeah, for these uh, women. And uh, when there is severe preeclampsia and you also assess uh, you know, fetal distress, you didn't want to waste any time. Then when there is previous caesarean section, you didn't want to cause any uterine rupture with the contractions of the uterus and so you may quickly have to go in to section these women so basically you have to conduct an elective surgery for these women with previous cesarean section now when there is prolapse of the first baby you may quickly have to go in to section this woman to prevent you know nipping of the cord by the presenting part of uh, the fetus which is an obstetric emergency also uh, uh, abnormal uterine contractions will prolong uh, uh, labor and so you may have to go in to uh, conduct cesarean section also in contracted pelvis you may have to do cesarean section and also when the first baby is in a non-cephalic presentation you quickly have to go uh, and conduct cesarean section such as if the baby is presenting with a bridge foot limb bridge in all these instances you may have to conduct cesarean section now, in monoamniotic twin, you may want to quickly do cesarean section for them since there is a possibility 
for the umbilical cord of the second twin to prolapse once the uh, you know the first twin is delivered and so you may want to prevent this obstetric emergency and so once you're able to identify that it is monoamniotic uh, elective cesarean section is always uh, preferred then also in monochorionic twin uh, to twin uh, you know transfusion syndrome as we've explained you may want to uh, you know uh, do cesarean section to save uh, this uh, uh, these uh, babies and when there is a collision of both heads of the twin such that they are locking each other you may want to do cesarean section to uh, you know uh, deliver them so basically uh, these uh, are the little information i have on multiple pregnancy thank you very much for your time